He was a high school sweetheart and father of their beautiful baby girl. It was written in the stars, so she thought. Then his true colors surfaced. She was beaten, abused physically, verbally, and financially, left for dead. Today, Anita is a beacon of hope. This is how we cope. I'm Hugo Ribatika. Welcome back to another exciting edition of COPE. With me in the studio today is Anita Molibazzi. Anita, thank you so much for coming on to COPE. Thank you for inviting me. You were 17 years old and had just moved back to Johannesburg when you met your ex-partner. Oh yes, I just moved back to Johannesburg to complete my studies. Then that's where I met him. Tell us the events that unfolded. Um, he was the great guy, like any other guy that you see, you know, he was okay. Um, we met through a group of friends. Um, they were staying opposite where I moved in with my grandmother. So we met, everything was okay, everything was fine. She was uh, four years older than me. The relationship started like any normal relationship. Mm. Yeah, I didn't see anything bad about him. He was very attractive. Yeah. And you obviously grew to love him. Exactly. Um, he was someone who was very, like a sweet talker, kind of. So it was, for me, it was easy to fall in love with him. So yes, I did fall in love with him. And then at some point you had the baby? Um, after a long time, after three years in a relationship, everything was fine. And then after I completed my metric, my mom asked me to come back home to discuss the way forward with my studies. And then when I got back home, I discovered that I was pregnant, but after a long time, because we only discovered that I'm pregnant when I was eight months. Oh, wow. Yeah. And things in the relationship were already complicated because I saw a sign of an abuse and I decided to leave the relationship. Then when I went home, um, I was pregnant already. So my mom asked, what do I want? Because it was up to me. Mm. And I said to my mom, no, we, we have to let him know about the baby and hear his response and discuss the matter forward with, the, with his family mm. and see what we're going to do. And then we did contact the family. My mom contacted the family to discuss how are we going to meet, how are we going to discuss this. Remember, um, now I went back to Mpumalang after my metric so my mom wanted to call them set up a meeting with them so that we can discuss this and they refused the family refused um, I never had a good relationship with his family this was because of the, the difference of our religions mm -hmm. they believe that in their religion you have to take a wife from church like that so they thought the relationship is over because I disappeared after my metric but we, we were still communicating mm -hmm. He was still calling me, he was still asking to come and see me and all of that. And then my mom talked to, to his family to discuss the way forward and they refused. And then he called me, he's like, your mom called and my mom, your mom said, um, they just discovered that you are pregnant. And I, 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 I also like used to think that maybe that's the reason you ran away, maybe. So he said, no, I, I do accept the, the, the damage. Mm. I want to be there for the kid. Um, for how, me, did, how did that make you feel when he said he'd take responsibility? For me, it, it, it felt okay like to hear him manning up. Remember, I was raised by a stepfather. So I always wanted, like had this thing that I want to have kids and the husband here, mm. the father mm. of the children. So for me, I think that was the other thing that made me to continue with the relationship because th there was a child involved. So I felt like um, if now I'm going to leave this guy, I, feel, I felt like it's going to be a chain. My child is going to grow up with a single parent like I did or with a different father like I did. I was, I was raised pretty well by the, by the stepfather, but I had fear of mm. doing the same thing, not knowing what kind of a person that I will find who will raise my child. So for him coming back, I felt like, okay, cool. But now it was no longer about me anymore. 
it was also about the child. So that's the main reason I went back to the relationship. So did you physically move from Pumalanga back to Johannesburg? Exactly. Because I felt like there's nothing anymore for me here. Let me just go back home, take a gap year, decide what I want to do. And then if I have to come back to Joburg, I will come back knowing exactly what I'm here to do. But w now with the child being involved, it, 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 was, it was sort of a distraction because how this pregnancy thing came about, it confused me in a way, like mm. I never knew I was pregnant until I was eight months. And you were only 17 years old? And I was 10, in, you... no, then I was already 19, yeah, 19, 10, 20. So two years yeah, after you'd returned to Joburg? Yes. Um, I was very scared. I was very scared, went to see the doctor to discuss like why I never had any signs mm. of, of showing pregnancy and all of that. The doctor did give us a biological term, like, okay, because of this or that. But the baby was born very healthy, even though it was a long overdue pregnant. I was pregnant for 11 months, oh, wow. two weeks, three days. And the doctor felt like it's, it's too long. They had mm. to do the induction to, to take the baby out. So baby was born, had you already moved back to Johannesburg then? No, the baby was born Bumalanga, but he was very supportive. If I tell him that I went to see the doctor, he will want to know what are the procedures, what is the next step. And he was supporting financially then, like I need to see a doctor. He will try by all means to get some cash and send it. No, go consult a doctor and tell me what's happening. I'm going to the hospital uh, to deliver the baby very soon. He will come. We'll go do the, the shopping things for the baby so that when the baby comes, at least we have the... Um, the essential things. So did you, obviously, then the abuse started at some point? Um, the abuse started when he assumed that I was cheating on him because we went to a party. When we got to the party, I met, uh, we met an old friend who came with a guy who wanted me back then. But we never had a chance to talk because of the movements. I, I, I've been up to Mpumalanga, Gauteng and so forth. So. He got angry, you know, when we were in the middle of the party, he got angry. So I saw this anger that I've never seen before. And the following day I went to school and when I came back from school and he just came to me and we're like, um, at my grandmother's yard, he's like, yeah, they told me that you're dating that guy. And when I was like, no, I'm not. When I was trying to explain, he slapped me. And that was the first sign of abuse, but I had that thing that no man, I love him, I was wrong, maybe I blamed myself at first, like maybe the way I talked to that guy, mm. to him it was, it looked very wrong, I was not supposed to do that. So it started then accepting it at the first stage, like blaming yourself or putting yourself there and be like, no, I'm the one who was wrong. And from time to time he would show a sign of anger, a sign of anger. But were you living with him at the time? No, 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 no. Like I would visit him once in a while, like not, not like permanent, like visiting him, but like after school, I'll go see him. Later in the day, he will come see me, something like that. But there, there will be days whereby he'll be angry, like angry, showing this anger that I didn't understand. So I felt like ugh, this relationship, it's not going to work. So I'm just going to complete my metric and go back home but only to discover when I'm at home that hey, I'm pregnant now. So what am I gonna do with the kid alone? Am I gonna raise my child the way I was raised? I was raised by a stepdad, which I was raised very fine. But for me, my dream was to have someone here, the baby daddy here, and raise the kid with me. You're watching Coke, and we're speaking to Anita Olivetsi. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Coke, and we're speaking to Anita. She met the love of her life at 17. At 19, they had a baby. Things were wonderful for a moment and progressively got worse. And joining us for the second segment is Tanasha, our resident counselor. Tanasha, welcome onto the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. Anita, so after the baby, you moved to Johannesburg, but things started to get worse. Yeah, things started to get worse. Actually, he, I saw flames, eh? I saw flames. Um, after moving in with him, 
I think the, um, the emotional and verbal abuse started. I would feel that every day and I got used to it. I, I got used to the anger, the emotional abuse. I got used to being told that you cannot do that. I got used to being told that you are not meant for that. You, you, I wanted a driver's license, like a simple thing. He will tell me that, okay, go. You will go a week or so, and after that, he will come and be like, that guy, that instructor, he wants you. You can't go back there. So I felt like I'm in a cage because I was not even allowed to have any social handle. I was not even allowed to have any friends to socialize with, to visit, or any friend that would come and visit me. I was not even allowed to go home at some certain point. Like, you cannot go home. When you go home, I think maybe he felt like I'll tell my parents what was going on. And he's like, your parents cannot know that we're staying together. Because if they know, I know your mom, she'll go crazy and she can come here and take you away from me. I want you and my kids to be here. And at some point I felt like even financially we're struggling a bit. So I wanted to help him. Then I asked him, can I find a job? He agreed. And I did find a job. I started working for the first time, starting to enjoy my salary. And he was like, I need to go home. And there are certain things that I need to do at home. And I need a certain amount of money. But I, we don't have that amount of money. He's like, no, you're working. You have a pay slip. You can go to the bank. You will take a loan. And this is how much I need. I'll pay the loan. But in a sense of a sweet way, kind of, mm. he will make you believe that I'll be there for you if you fall. So I did take some loans. I, did I took a loan, first loan with this other bank and it was not enough and he's like um there's this other loan people that can borrow us money i need to fill up this money it needs to be this amount and i agreed the first time the money hit the account he took a thousand of that money he went and he got drunk and when he came back that was the first day um he physically abused me he, he battered me up and I woke up with bruises. In the morning, he saw that I am not, I am not like the person that he's used. I, every time I wake up seeing my breakfast, but that day I was just not okay because I was so much in pain. Mm. And at the same time, I felt for the baby because he, he never even cares that the baby can see. The baby screaming and me like, no. How old was your baby then? Um, the baby was about to turn two years old. He, he, he never even cared about like those certain things. So for me, it was every time I had to hide how I feel so that my baby cannot feel my emotions. Did this abuse carry on? It did. It carried on to the certain point where I got used to be beaten up. At some time when he goes, he comes back, I know I'm going to be beaten up. And when he doesn't do it, I'll ask myself, today he's not beating me up, why? What did I do wrong? It, it felt like a norm. It felt like it's something that needs to happen. And then after the physical abuse, it went to sexual. I, I had to, to do it even if I don't want to, even if it's my cycle month. To, to him, it didn't matter. He has to get what he wants. And psychologically, I had this thing that whatever he says, it goes. Whatever he wants, I must do. Whatever that that he says, I must do it exactly the way he wants it. So it got to the point whereby it got worse because I wanted to go back to school. I joined the aviation industry and I had to do some courses. He was fine at first, but I used to feel bad for the kid because now as the relationship grows, the abuse grows, she's also there, she's growing, now she can see more. There was a time where she asked me, mommy, why can't we leave daddy and go? Because I feel like you're not happy. Every time when daddy comes here, you cry. Every time daddy comes here, everything goes otherwise. And that was a sign that my kid is being abused too, even though she, he doesn't touch the kid mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. say the things to the kid. But she does feel the abuse and for her is worse. Because every time now when daddy walks in, she will jump. Even if she was black, she will jump and come and cuddle me and look at him and be like, daddy, today what are you going to do? 
Are you going to beat mommy up? Are you going to... And like, no, daddy's not going to do that. But he never stopped. He never stopped. And sometimes you will talk to people um, in a secret way, as if like you're talking for a friend and you get some advice. And many mm. people were like, no, I mean, I will leave, you know, I will leave. It's not healthy. It's not healthy for the kid and so forth and so forth. I used to cry every day. I used to, I used to crack every day, but I felt like um, I accepted the abuse. I felt like if not this, then what, what else, what else should I do? Remember, I met this person, like he was my first boyfriend. So I knew nothing about love. I knew nothing how love supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So I thought this is it. I have to be strong. I have to, because sometimes you will hear old women saying in a relationship, you have to be strong. You have to be a woman. So for me, it was maybe this is the part where mm -hmm. I have to be strong. I have to be strong for my kid. If I want this daddy to be here, I have to do it no matter what that may cost. So I felt that maybe I do need to leave this person because I got sick and then I went to the doctor. The doctor said, you are, you are depressed. And I was very in denial. No, I'm not. Then they prescribed some medication for me. He mm. didn't know about it. So I was taking this medication secretly. And at some point he felt like I'm hiding things for him. So it got worse, it got worse, it got worse and worse and worse. And I wanted out because the doctor would be like, there's something bothering you. So I was starting to talk to this doctor. I wanted out. It was so hard until I was brave enough looking at my life that um, in the next six months, I'll be able to, to get a salary from somewhere and I can start paying these bills little by little. I need to make a move out from this relationship because it's destroying me, it's destroying the child. And the following year, the child, uh, she had to start schooling. So I felt I need to do better. And then I told him, I wanna leave. And I don't want us to fight about this, but I wanna come out. Mm. And he's like, okay, cool. I'm like, like really? Like, yeah, fine, you, you can go. No problem. He, he was okay. And I was even surprised. I was like, okay, so just like that, he's going to leave me. Then I left. I went to stay with my aunt for two days. I told him to take the baby home. He did. He did. But he just took the baby to see the grandparent. He came back with the baby. And I was like, but I told him to take the baby home mm. because I wanted to do this whole thing while the baby is not there. Then there was something that happened that almost cost you your life. Um, he found my pills uh, after I found him with the girl in the house again. So he was angry. He found my, my depression pills. And he took all those depression pills, he put them in a juice. And when I came back from work, he asked me, are you going to eat? I'm like, no, I'm not hungry. And then he came with a diary, taking out a piece of papers. And he says, you're going to write a letter to your daughter. You're going to write a letter to your mother. You're going to write a letter to me. I'm like, okay, what is this all about? No, you, you write as if like tomorrow you will be dead. When you read this, I'll be no more. I want you to know I loved you. And, and, and. I'm like, but that sounds like I'm writing suicidal letter. Mm. Am I going to die? He said, if you're not going to do this, I will make you do it. I never know that this guy had a gun. I don't know where the gun came from. And... He put a gun here. He's like, you will write the letters. And I did. I wrote the letters. I wrote the letters. And then he gave me the juice. He's like, okay, cool. You're going to drink that and go to sleep. The juice tasted a bit funny, but I didn't understand what it was. So you didn't know he'd put anything in it? No, because I was not there. I did drink the juice. And my daughter was here when he was doing this whole thing. And when I was done drinking the juice, he bring a glass full of whiskey. You're going to drink this. And when you're done drinking this, you're going to go to bed and sleep. And he sat there, kept on drinking, kept on smoking and all of that. And when I was done drinking the juice, I felt that something is not okay with me. And then I started asking him, like, what did you do to me? He's like, I told you that if I cannot have you, no one will. Because you told me that you want to leave. And I told that you are mine. If you want to leave, you will go out here with a coffin. That's, that's what I told you. No one is going to have you if I can't have you.
And then I started feeling drowsy and all of that. I went to the fridge, I took a milk. I think I drank a liter of milk. And then I started vomiting. I kept asking him to call an ambulance. I kept asking him to call an ambulance and I'll tell who, whosoever is gonna pick me up that I did this to myself. Mm -hmm. I'll make sure that he's not involved. He didn't until in the morning he left me. And when he left me, he left and locked me inside. I had to ask the kid to go out on the window to ask and shout for help. And the kid went and came with someone from the street. And I woke up in the hospital, then they told me I've been out for five days. Wow. And I didn't even know what happened. I didn't even know who I was. I know nothing. And my parents didn't even know what was happening. Someone had taken my child. I was... It, 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 I was confused until they brought my baby. That's where I had started feeling like the flashbacks. Then the police were like, we, we're going to take you. You were trying to kill yourself, so we're going to arrest you. We want you to tell us what happened. I was in some kind of a place where they kept me because they felt like I'm not safe to myself, mm -hmm. to my kid. They kept me there until the child told the nurse that, no, mommy, the drink that she, she drank, did he put a sugar? But the sugar, she took it. He took it out of the peel, and he put it there. So literally, your daughter got you off the hook. Exactly. Tinashe, this is absolutely incredible. <laughs> it is incredible, but unfortunately, it's such a common story. Like it's absolutely devastating that a lot of women have to go through this from a space of wanting to be in love to have a companion, to create a family for yourself. And people can manipulate that and people can control that. I mean, just having met Anita for a few hours, I already know that she's someone who's loving and empathetic and people will use that over people and then you spiral. But what, what compels a woman to stay in this relationship? Because <laughs> you, you, would, you would assume that at the earliest sign of abuse you you're going to run that. for cover you think that but i think okay i might be wrong on the statistic but apparently it takes an average woman to leave an abusive partner 13 times they leave 13, 13 incidents times. of abuse no no 13 times of trying to leave mm -hmm. so that means you're like oh i'm done pack <sighs> okay no then you're like okay next time mm. <sighs> then oof you know so it is something that is of course, we are told by our family members that you won't understand until you're in a relationship, how exactly. these things go. But at the end of the day, it's like, I actually don't want to find it out. How do we protect ourselves so that mm. this doesn't happen? Which is why all of these things are linked structurally, systematically, because she just wanted to create a better life for herself and her child. And you can't be blamed for loving someone whose good side you had seen once. And it's not like you are a trained professional who immediately you'll be like, ooh, psychopath, let me run. You know, we are yeah. humans, we are here to love, we're here to care. And unfortunately, there are some of us who will manipulate that. Because so let's talk a little bit about the, the abuser. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Anita left her family and support structure. Mm -hmm. And he insisted that she make no contact. Mm -hmm. Is this part of the strategy of an abuser? Of course. I mean, you have to isolate someone so that they feel like you are their only lifeline. You alienate them from everybody else uh, so that you are the source of love, hate, everything, sustenance, finance, everything. So by streamlining everything to just your home with that person, it gives you more control. And the more that they see you adopting to these grooming techniques, the more they keep pushing, you know, like, oh, OK, she's fine with me beating her every day. OK, let me see what else I can try. I can even actually start seeing other women because I know she's not going to go anywhere. Mm. So they're also learning. It's not like someone is just raised to be an abuser. They're also learning the hunger by seeing how they are treating somebody else. Mm. So it becomes an entire, it's, it's a mess, but it's very normal mess, unfortunately. Like literally, you learn more about each other as you push each other's buttons. It's just unfortunate mm. that sometimes those buttons can really ultimately lead to someone's death. Exactly. Now, Anita, that process of recovery for you to find yourself, grow in strength, grow in stamina, so to speak, <coughs> how did you navigate that process? Yo, it, it, was, it was very hard, I must say. It was, it was very hard. When I thought I was out of the abuse of the baby daddy, after moving out a month later, I was gang raped. 
Um, so it felt like a chain, like maybe there's something hunting me, something is hunting me. And when, when the rape happened, I sometimes thought maybe he sent people because even when we were trying to, to do the investigation, the law failed me. At the end of the day, it was not what I can say, it was not what I can tell them, but mm -hmm. if there's no evidence, there's, th there's no way they can help me. Um, I thought I needed something, but to tell you the truth, I wanted revenge. I, I planned it over and over in my head. Like, I know where he stays, I know where he works, I know what he, I could have killed him. But what kept me from not doing that was my daughter, because I knew that if I get caught, I'm not a murderer, I don't know how to do it. Mm. What if I do this, I get caught, I'll go to jail, what will happen to my kid? So what stopped me is that, but I wanted him dead, I wanted to kill him myself, I wanted, I wanted like a room where I can keep him and make him feel exactly what he made me feel, because he, he damaged me. I couldn't be in a relationship anymore. I couldn't trust. I couldn't love. I couldn't. I, I never wanted anything to do with a man, because I felt like they are all the same. Th that was then. But what helped me was church. Was mm -hmm. was was finding that spiritual healing first. Mm -hmm. And when I got that healing spiritually, I managed to deal with my finances. I managed to deal with my emotions. I managed to deal with myself. I managed to get that confident and feel that, yeah, I am beautiful. And I believe that someone will love me and value me as a woman. And, and that really helped me because I gained that confidence mm back as a woman. Anita, your story is absolutely incredible. You're a brave woman and a very, very strong woman at that. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Tinashe, always good to have you. Until next week, take care of yourself and remember, together we can.